Hi, I'm Brad Power, and this is the Cancer Patient Lab. And today we're honored to have with us Chandra Koda, who's going to give us some background and information about how to think about radiation treatment for cancer. Uh, Chandra's a longtime friend. He's been involved with our activities for many years. Um, he's currently based in Pennsylvania and Delaware. Um, when I got to know him, he was doing something at Yale. Uh, he's a radiation oncologist. And early on, I had to learn that there's a difference in the radiation that's used for diagnosis and the radiation that's used for treatment. And Chandra had to keep correcting me on those, those distinctions, I remember. Um, just to cover our housekeeping, um, as those of you who are here will know, um, this is uh, for information purposes only and is not medical advice. Uh, please consult your doctor, um, but we're trying to give you information that will help you in conversations with your medical team. And uh, everything that you say uh, will be made public. This is a public conversation. If you're concerned about that, um, turn off your camera, change your name, um, don't say anything. <laughs> Otherwise, it will be made public. And then finally, um, we are the Cancer Patient Lab. We're a patient-led organization and we uh, our volunteers, so we depend on the kindness of, of members to make donations, so please donate uh, if you are so inspired. Um, so that'll turn it over to Chandra, who will give us an introduction to um, thoughts about how to think about radiation. Thanks a lot, Brad. Thanks for the opportunity. Uh, I want to share, um, like Brad said, some thoughts about um, radiation and its place um, in treatment for cancer. Uh, I am what's called a medical physicist. It's a very niche field. So what we do is uh, we are uh, more of experts on the technology side um, uh, to deal with radiation, both in radiation therapy as well as in diagnostic imaging. And uh, we help with the, the radiation oncologists for the medical doctors and uh, designing the treatment plans and overseeing the delivery of treatments and quality control and quality assurance and all those kinds of things. So it's kind of, uh, you could think of it like a pharmacist, but also doing other things beyond uh, just what pharmacists might do in, on the medical oncology side. Okay. I'm trying to figure out how to uh, advance my slides here. So I like to think of uh, just thinking outside the box for my day job. Like I think of this whole universe of oncology as the oncoverse. So it's um, it's very complicated, as you can see. Like I made up this slide. It's uh, there is our lives. It's it's. As we get older, most of us will probably get likely to get some kind of cancer. That's just the body's natural uh, aging mechanism, so it seems. And then, uh, then you go through the diagnosis, and then you meet a bunch of specialists who are going to try to make things better for us, right? Like a surgical oncologist, medical oncologist, radiation oncologist, and there's all these other people on the outside, like it's who are also working diligently trying to make things better for everybody. Like there's pharma, there's device, there's insurance people, there's private equity trying to try and invest money and spur innovation. And the support organizations, uh, a lot of them are just volunteer, like uh, like the one that Brad runs, like that's it's it's more focused towards trying, trying to find uh, treatments for outside of standard of care, but there are other support organizations which just are there so if a patients need like somebody to talk to or or uh, go visit and get some help like they're there like for example I volunteer one at one like cancer support community of uh, greater Philadelphia it's it's a great place and there's others so um, the problem is um, since about like 30 years ago like it's everything's changing so fast like it's a, there's new understanding of disease and there's new technologies, there's new clinical pathways, and there's just an explosion of knowledge. And uh, I'm from the provider side, so we take care of patients, right? So in the hospital setting. So I just see like there's so much new knowledge coming out and it's a challenge like to keep uh, 
the staff educated, the physicians educated, how do you disseminate all this knowledge and all these pathways so they can get down to the clinical level so that patients can benefit from it. So within radiation oncology, we can think of uh, the field as uh, like this. As a patient, you would come in and uh, you would consult with the doctor. The doctor might order more scans and come up with a clinical treatment plan. And uh, there's a bunch of jargon that's used. Uh, you would move on to the next step, which is called a simulation. And that's usually done with a CAT scan. And we do uh, plan the radiation, uh, how the radiation beams will be directed at the tumor based off of the CAT scan. So radiation treatment is a very targeted treatment. It's, uh, and we treat well-defined localized disease. We cannot treat diffuse disease. So once it's well-defined and localized, like we target it using radiation planning, and then we do a lot of quality assurance to make sure that whatever has been planned is the, one, is the radiation that's going to be delivered to the treatment, or to the patient. And then there's the treatment itself. It could be external beam using linear accelerators. We usually call them LINAC for short. There's a different procedure called brachytherapy where you insert radioactive material into the target area. Uh, as far as prostate goes, prostate seed implants are, is a very common one. And there's also high dose rate brachytherapy for prostate, which few places do. We do a lot of uh, prostate seed implants. I'll touch upon that a little briefly. And after that, there is follow-up scans to look for response assessment. And then pretty much patients are left to their own. Like it's uh, till something bad happens and they come back into the healthcare system and then the cycle starts all over again. So within uh, our field, we have radiation oncology. So the medical doctors were trained to understand radiation and also other parts of oncology. Like they have a fairly decent knowledge of medical oncology and surgical oncology because they're to work with those two specialties uh, in a multidisciplinary way, trying to figure out how to combine treatments to maximize benefit for our patients. So after that, we have medical physicists. We are, like I said, we are the technical side. We understand the radiation. We understand radiation machines. We understand treatment planning. And we oversee dosimetrists and therapists are the staff you might encounter if you ever had these treatments. They're the ones who put you on the table, uh, the, they, they take care of you, they position you on the table, make sure you're in the right position, and then they administer the treatment with the machine. Of course, there are nurses and navigators who facilitate uh, the process for the doctors and make everything work seamlessly. Unfortunately, uh, the field is such that like billing and uh, account that those people are also very important. Like everything's become prior up these days. So it's very important for those staff like to keep on top of the billing companies to make sure they get all the approvals in time so that we can uh, the, deliver the treatments in a timely manner without any significant delays, which could impact uh, care. And these are very complex machines. So you have biomed staff and engineers who fix the machines as they break. If any of you had treatments, you might have experienced like in the middle of a treatment, a machine might break and then we are to kind of fix it and resume the treatment. So there's a lot of jargon in our field, uh, external beam radiation therapy, that's EBRT. And uh, there's the next one is IMRT, which is intensity modulated radiation therapy. There's VMAT, which is modulated arc therapy. There's SPRT, the stereotactic body radiation therapy. There's SABER, which is stereotactic ablative radiation therapy. SRS, which is stereotactic radio surgery. And a lot of this jargon is historical in nature and also related to uh, how we can bill for things because it's a very procedural based uh, field. And uh, we do different tasks and we are allowed to bill for each of those individual tasks. So the acronyms kind of got tied in with uh, uh, what the billing folks decided like when new things uh, came up. So there's not necessarily very helpful or very reflective of what's really happening. So just to give you a brief overview, most of the treatments we do with external beam radiation are, is with uh, machines called Linux. Protons are different. I'll briefly talk about it in a bit. And uh, these are high, really high energy photons. So it's, they're so high that you cannot just generate them like you would with a X-ray tube. So there's 
uh, special devices called uh, linear accelerator tubes, and that's why the name is LINAC. And uh, as you may know, like uh, the patient would lay on the table and this machine rotates around and delivers treatment according to the radiation plan. So historically, like uh, when I first entered the field about 30 years ago, the, it was a very simple and a crude treatment. So we could only shape, uh, target the fields very crudely around the prostate. For example, I'm giving you examples of prostate here. So that's a prostate, and it used to be called a three-dimensional conformal treatment. We used to use four directions to come uh, to attack the prostate. But a lot of other organs in the path of these beams got the radiation dose as well, and we had no good way to control it. So the next development, uh, significant development technically was something called a multi-leaf collimator. And what that let us do is uh, shape the beams a lot better so we could tailor the radiation dose to the target and spare the rectum and the bladder much better than we could with the th three-dimensional conformal therapy. And the one after that that came as uh, once the called the volumetric arc therapy, which is similar to the IMRT, except that the machine is continuously rotating around the patient. So the radiation dose is tailored even better than those. So I'll try to play this little video for a very short time, which uh, kind of gives a, an idea of what's uh, going on. It's maybe I can't. It's... Okay. I'm trying to launch a YouTube video from the PowerPoint, so I'm not sure it's going to work. Yeah, it's not a big deal if it doesn't. So uh, there's different kinds of radiation um, most commonly used. Uh, we have X-rays and electrons are very common. Photons are less common, but more so these days. And there's several facilities, but not as many as uh, conventional radiation. So I want to sp spend just a little time like explaining to you the difference, the main difference. Photons are called uncharged particles. That means they can travel infinite distances in matter until they interact with something. So they tend to have uh, within a patient, they, this is called depth dose distribution. So they tend to have this, uh, the blue curve indicates it. Most of the dose is deposited towards the surface of the patient and where the tumor would be located at depth, there's a lot less radiation dose there. So the way we achieve a treatment is to direct the radiation beams at the tumor from different directions so that like the tumor dose itself becomes more than the surface dose based on the number of beams we use. Electrons uh, have a dose distribution. They don't go very far because they're charged particles and they interact with matter very, in a very definite way. But they're not very useful because they cannot be focused very well. They're very light particles, so they scatter a lot within the body. So they're not used in a very precise uh, way for precise treatments. Protons, on the other hand, they're much heavier than electrons, so they're very, uh, they have a very characteristic depth dose curve. This is called the Bragg peak. So the entrance dose is very low because uh, they have high energy protons. And as they get slower, they interact more with matter and they deposit a lot more dose. And then they eventually come to a complete stop. So that's a distal end. So the benefit of protons is that like beyond this uh, point, there's no dose at all. So you're able to spare things in theory much better than you can ever uh, hope to do with photons. So this is an example of a prostate plan uh, with conventional photons and protons. And what you see here is uh, with photons, there's a lot more dose all around because we have to come around from different directions. But with protons, you don't need to do that. You only need a few beams, often it's two or three, and it's much better defined. So you're sparing a lot of the other tissues. So there is no doubt or any uh, discussion like about the fact that protons create much better dose distributions. The only challenge is like, does it really benefit the patient? And is it worth the cost uh, for, for all treatments? There are some cases where protons are definitely better, but the question that we have within the field, uh, the, the discussions that, that we have are, is it essential to treat every single patient with protons? 
So there needs to be a lot more um, patient selection going on. So the other difference is uh, different radiations deposit uh, their uh, interact differently and deposit dose differently. So uh, you might have heard about radiation dose, so which is in physics it's defined as energy deposited per unit mass. Unfortunately, the way it's deposited is so different among different uh, kinds of uh, kinds of radiation that the dose by itself doesn't reflect biological effect. So there's two differences I want to point out. It's uh, it's kind of uh, interesting because. You might hear about this from the radiopharmaceutical uh, treatments point of view as well. And if you have any questions at any time, please stop me and um, feel free to um, discuss. So low dose, uh, low LAT, it's low linear energy transfer. So the ionizations are very sparse at a cellular level. So they might cause single um, strand DNA damage. Occasionally, they might cause some double strand DNA damage. And it's conventional wisdom that you need like several double strand damages to effectively kill a cell for reproductive death. The, this high LAT radiation, which has alpha particles or uh, heavy ion beams, or the very, very distal end of a proton track. When the protons almost stop, like that it becomes a really high LAT radiation. These are very dense ionization tracks. They create, create such dense ionizations that if they were to pass through a nucleus, they would create several uh, double strand breaks. So there's no chance for the cell to survive. So that's a difference uh, there. So because of that, the same dose may reflect in different uh, biological effect. And within our field, we try to address that by assigning different radiations and different um, relative biological effect values. So it's not a very sophisticated way of uh, um, thinking about those. To complicate things further, the effect of radiation on tissue depends on the radiation type, also the dose rate and the total dose. So the dose rate is a very interesting one. Conventionally, uh, we used to treat um, about one and a half to about four gray per frac per fraction. So that's what we call it, like a daily treatment, we call that a fraction. And if you're getting one of these uh, more intense treatments, it's about seven to 20 gray per fraction. It turns out like um, if you give a conventional uh, radiation treatment to the prostate, depending on the diagnosis and the staging, it's about 70 to 80 gray in two gray fractions. Whereas for uh, SPRT or SABR, it's 40 gray, and eight gray fractions, but the tumor control is equivalent. So you see that like a smaller dose in gray could just because it's a more per fraction. So it turns out that uh, in this dose range, one and a half to four gray, there is only partial killing of the tumor cells. The cells can repair themselves as can normal tissue cells. So that's, uh, that's why uh, you don't get a very high, you need higher doses. But once you start going above eight gray or so, the density of ionization within tumor cells increases such that there's not as much repair going on. So you're killing more of the cells effectively. So that also means that if the normal cells, normal tissues were to be in this uh, dose range, they would also die. Like So you need to be very, very careful and deliver this treatment very precisely so that no, all the surrounding normal organs are much better spared than in a conventional treatment. There is yet another dose range, which is not used for prostate cancer or for cancers at all. Uh, it's, uh, if you give like a very, very high dose per fraction in upwards of 50 gray, radiation results in ablative lesions. That is, you kill everything like that, that, that you touch. And it is used in uh, treating non in treating non-cancerous benign conditions such as trigem trigeminal neuralgia, which is facial pain, essential tremors, etc. On the other hand, we are also more recently realizing or noticing that at lower doses, radiation seems to modulate inflammation. And there is a low dose RT is providing good pain control for osteoarthritis. Uh, this uh, 
treatment technique had fallen out of favor in this country, but uh, in Europe, they do things very differently. So there was a lot of low-dose RT literature in Europe. And we are just about seeing a, res a resurgent interest in this technique in the United States as well uh, to benefit patients. So in terms of dose distributions, I've already described earlier, um, the VMAC technique, the machine goes around the patient and confirms the dose as well as it can. That's the latest state of the art that we have with photons. And of course, with protons, there's different techniques and they create uh, definitely create better dose distributions than uh, photons. The question is, is it clinically benefit, beneficial for added cost? Okay, so a few thoughts about external beam delivery for prostate cancer. So we know that if we give uh, a very, very high dose to the prostate or any other tumor, we can achieve very good local control. So that's not the problem. Conventionally, in the olden days, like uh, we weren't quite sure what we were hitting with the radiation beam. So we used to add a margin around the target. And uh, because of that margin, the rectum and the bladder used to be subject to uh, higher doses as well, and those created complications. But these days, we have imaging incorporated into the linear accelerators. So we are able to see the uh, target as we treat so we can decrease those margins and make it tight. And uh, we are able to spare those organs much better, so thereby decreasing the side effects. A recent development is uh, one of rectal spacer gel in which uh, a hydrogel is placed between the rectum, uh, anterior rectal wall and the prostate. And that helps us in separating the rectum away from the prostate so that it receives very, very, very little high dose. But if the gel is not placed accurately by the physician doing it, it can get into the rectal wall and that can cause unnecessary complications for patients. There have been some reported in the literature. So it has to be done carefully. Uh, something that uh, is a pet peeve of mine is uh, we ask patients to fill their bladder during treatment. This is very challenging to just get it just right. And uh, oftentimes we have to get them off the table and have them sit around and drink more water and they to try to hold it all in. So this is uh, stressful. And we are not quite sure like it's necessary because most of the bladder is water anyway. But this is historical practice. So we are trying to like in the field, we try to uh, educate ourselves and try to do clinical research uh, at the institutional and multi-institutional level to see if we can change these things. Uh, there is increasing recognition that it's not the whole bladder that's as important to control the side effect as it's a bladder, bladder trigone in the urethra. So we try to see if we can create treatment plans that, that can uh, decrease dose to these substructures so that, it, that these kinds of treatments can be easier for our patients. There were two different, uh, there are two different uh, emerging technologies in external B. One is MR guided uh, linear accelerator. MR guidance is uh, very interesting because it provides much, much better soft tissue contrast like you can see in this little cutout here. This is a schematic uh, kind of showing how the MR image is acquired with the patient on the table. And you're able to see the prostate very clearly in this uh, sagittal view. And the benefit of this is you'll be able to decrease your margins so that you can spare uh, the urethra and the rectum much better than you can conventionally. There's been some very interesting work done at UCLA with this technology where they showed they could decrease the margins around the prostate, treat very tightly to the prostate, thereby decreasing uh, genital urinary side effects. The other one that's come about more recently is a PET guided linear accelerator, where if you were to uh, inject the patient with a PET isotope, uh, the tumor areas would light up and uh, you're able to target those areas and then treat them with this linear accelerator. So that's uh, called biologically guided radiation therapy. It would not be as useful as radiopharmaceutical therapy because that's too diffuse. But if you had limited number of uh, solid tumors that can be localized using PET imaging agents, 
this could be an interesting machine like on which uh, we can uh, treat patients very successfully. A few thoughts about brachytherapy. If I don't know if any of you have had it or has been discussed with you. Uh, we do a lot of these procedures at my current hospital. Um, it's uh, not quite an operating room. It's a clean room. And uh, the patient's under anesthesia. And we use an ultrasound, a rectal ultrasound with a biplanar probe so we can look at the prostate in two different cuts. And then we're able to put these needles and then insert the seeds very precisely. So away from the urethra, away from the rectum. So we do a radiation plan on the fly in the OR with the patient on the table. And then we insert the seeds and the procedure is complete in about uh, 45 minutes to an hour and the patients go home. And uh, if since this requires very delicate and accurate placement of seeds, it requires a lot more skill from our radiation oncologists than it does for delivering external beam radiation. Unfortunately, our field is dictated by uh, reimbursement issues. So this is, used to be popular uh, some time ago, but not as much anymore. So we use uh, two different kinds of seeds. It's iodine seeds and palladium seeds. Um, they have different characteristics. And these are what we call dose distributions around the seeds. And we have these all these bright spots that you see on the CAT scan of different seeds. And all these doses add up to create a composite dose distribution to treat the prostate to the desired dose to achieve good local control. Uh, radiopharmaceutical therapy, as we know, it's like a very new and interesting development that's come about in the past few years. Uh, where you have radioisotopes attached to biochemical molecules that attach receptors. And there's more and more new receptors being discovered and uh, investigated these days. It's, it's the field is uh, growing exponentially. And there's two different kinds of uh, emitters, uh, radioisotopes that, that are being investigated as well. That's beta emitters, which is basically electrons emitted by isotopes and alpha emitters. Uh, beta emitters have a low LET, so they're very diffuse kind of ionizations. And alpha emitters are high emitters, are very dense ionizations. The key is to have companion diagnostic. So we're able to assess ahead of time, like where the uh, RPT is, uh, radio pharmaceuticals going to go, and uh, if it's safe enough to administer it to the patient. So the beta emitters have a short range, few millimeters. They're not as damaging, but not as local either. So they give uh, radiation even to cells that are not immediately uh, uh, in the vicinity of uh, the radio pharmaceutical. Alpha emitters are much shorter range in comparison, just a few hundreds of microns. They're much more damaging, but a very local effect. So we need to make sure that there's enough of these uh, isotope molecules uh, close to each cell that you want to kill. So this is a very promising uh, technique for diffuse disease where external beam is not practical or cannot be just done. There's many nuances to be flushed out like a patient specific dosing, like right now it's unit dose for all patients, timing of dosing. And uh, the field is just uh, beginning to try to figure out how to calculate radiation dose to tumor and organs and trying to establish a response because in external beam radiation therapy and brachytherapy, we have a long history of understanding the relation between radiation dose and tumor response. So it would be useful to have this so we can uh, uh, fine tune radiopharmaceutical therapy a little better. I just uh, saw this on Twitter or LinkedIn uh, today, like where there's a study out of Germany showing that with lutetium, they had, uh, instead of uh, giving the straight course, they had a gap in between and they showed that they were able to uh, get better, better patient uh, survival uh, based on this, uh, this technique. So these kinds of investigations are just beginning to happen now that the drugs are out and FDA approved. So a few advances in prostate radiotherapy that we see from the trenches, uh, there's better diagnosis with multi-parametric MRI and ultrasound fused targeted biopsies. So you're actually, when you do a biopsy, you're hitting the area where you kind of know where the disease is. And there's better risk ass assessment using newer tools and tests. Uh, we use this test in our clinic. Um, I'll let you read through those. 
And uh, for radiation treatments, we are able to target like the lesions that are more suspect for, to be disease instead of the whole prostate. Conventionally, we used to treat the whole prostate to uniform dose. But now that with the multi-parametric MRI, we can see the areas of disease more clearly. Uh, we incorporate that into radiation planning and we give those areas higher dose than the rest of the prostate with hopes of controlling um, the tumor better. Uh, some of these are uh, hopefully we'll, in the near future, we'll get to here, try to figure out how to uh, spare better, spare more critical structures uh, that we define more carefully instead of gross structures such as bladder. Uh, try all sort of get urethral sparing. Unfortunately, uh, this is a well-established field and uh, to, to show that we can uh, benefit patients, we have to be very careful and methodical in what we do. And clinical trials take a long time for these answers to mature because uh, the side effects, uh, the late effects take quite a bit of time to manifest themselves. So it's not something we can do um, in a few months. We have challenges in radiation therapy as a mature field. Uh, there's little policy support for innovation. Uh, our reimbursement is mainly dictated by CMS and usually in a downward trajectory. There's little incentive, incentive for private equity investment because of reimbursement issues, which is very different than the pharma field. And research is conducted via institutional or cooperative clinical groups, and it's not as well funded as pharma research. And uh, also there's no marketing to educate general public and patients of new developments uh, that, we can, that we have done like uh, in our field so many patients are not aware that the radiation that we give today is not the same radiation that they might have heard about 20, 30 years ago, which caused a lot of side effects uh, to, the, to their loved ones. So that's those are the thoughts I wanted to share with you today and uh, open to questions. Chandra, thank you for that overview. Um, the way that we typically do this is to use the raise hand feature so that if anyone has a question, a comment, um, then we call on them after they raise their hand. And I'll call on them and also monitor the chat for you. Um, the, other, the other thing is I would encourage anybody uh, who's had experience with radiation to share their stories um, so that we can see it from the patient's point of view and maybe ask Chandra some questions, uh, you know, like what you what you what treatment you had and how things might be different today. Um, I'll get us started. Um, I'm curious, and it was sort of in your last, so we, we've had sessions on radio ligands and um, Oliver Sartor, I think is a leader in this area. And he uh, had a session with us that sort of talked about this. So that seems to be more in almost like the pharmaceutical area because uh, Pluvicto in particular has become a popular line of therapy. And I think is almost a block, you know, achieved almost blockbuster drug status. So at least the radio ligands would seem to be getting the kind of investment that you said is hard to find when you're talking about machines, you know, like big pieces of hardware that deliver radiation. So um, maybe there's a crossover there. Is, is, are, are, are you not seeing that uh, pharmaceutical companies are very happy to invest in the, um, um, in the uh, uh, kind of radio ligand types of therapies? No, you're correct. Like radio ligands are, are pharmaceutical products. So uh, they're investing very heavily. I think just in the last uh, six months or so, there's been a lot of um, startup activity. I think the big farmers have spent collectively like 10 to $15 billion buying our different startups. Um, so they're definitely betting big on radio ligands. There's no doubt about it. Um, and I would hope, very much hope that they work. But but the problem is uh, we know like when you start targeting like with receptors and stuff, like you might get most of the cancer cells, but all you need is a few left behind and they start growing back up again. And uh, so it's not like a cure all or like a solution that would, um, solve the problem like or, or enhance local control for everybody across the board. 
uh, for extended periods. Um, if you had those kinds of investments in external beam, for example, we would see a lot more innovation like uh, using uh, other kinds of technologies. It's other kinds of targeting. It's a different way of thinking about it. And we might, we might be able to uh, achieve a better control for a lot of patients. It's, for example, we keep complaining within our field that protons are very expensive. Again, that's related to uh, the reimbursement issues. But I feel like if we compare those treatments to what the radio pharmaceuticals cost, probably they're not that expensive relatively. And, and if you start thinking along those lines, uh, so maybe there's, we can show much more value like with, with those kinds of advanced technologies, which cost a lot more. Okay, Rob, Rob's raised his hand. <clears throat> so Brad, I thought I'd pick up on your, um, let me share my patient perspective around radiation because uh, as a three-time cancer survivor, uh, I've had radiation three times so I can uh, sort of describe different journeys. Um, my first one, which was for testicular cancer was back in 1991. Um, and I'll say at the time, it, it's probably very old technology that was used. Let's put it this way, that the um, technicians would get me set and then they'd go down the hall and they'd run and they would yell to me, you know, hold your breath. And the machine went on and, uh, you know, sort of did its thing. And then they would come back and, uh, you know, it was it was, uh, it was fairly archaic. Uh, it was uh, external beam, but uh, I'm sure it was not very targeted and uh, and not very focused. Um, then in in uh, in 2010, um, I had liposarcoma and had uh, surgery followed by radiation treatment on my back. Um, which was, I believe, four weeks of continuous radiation treatment. Um, the interesting aspect of that for me was actually uh, overexposure to this day. I still have burns from, uh, from that treatment. Um, so again, external beam, I'll say fairly low technology at the time. Um, 2014, or to, in 2015, I had actually proton beam treatment as follow-up for pancreatic cancer. So after uh, Whipple and then uh, chemotherapy, uh, I had proton radiation. Now, interestingly, and I'm going to come to the, the reimbursement aspect in a second, because that is a huge, huge challenge. Um, but interestingly... Um, the case that got me to have the insurance co company actually eventually pay for proton beam was that my radiologist argued that I'd had so much radiation exposure previously that it really needed to be very targeted and minimal as possible. And that was sort of the rationalization for using proton beam. A, it would be, we thought it would be more effective but B, that traditional radiation, my body probably just couldn't handle that level of dosage. Um, but it raises an issue, and I assume it's, I'll throw it out more as a question in terms of sort of the whole reimbursement angle as it relates to proton beam, and how do we go about sort of making a more compelling case as a patient to have proton beam considered as a viable option versus the cheaper sort of standard radiation approach. So that's sort of some, a bit of background and then a question. Yes, uh, without a doubt, like uh, for re-radiation, like protons definitely have the benefit, right? Like they're much more focused and they can, uh, we can, Tailor them much better than photons. It's and and more and we see more and more patients coming back, like and they, they survive and come back uh, with other cancers or like maybe recurrences. So that this re-radiation is also new to us in our field. And then the, the science and uh, and uh, and the biology has to be flushed out too. We don't know how 
uh, the tissues repair themselves, like with all these different kinds of uh, treatments that we've been giving. So that there's a renewed interest in that as well. And going back to your sarcoma, that's a very difficult one to treat, like on the surface, because it's a, we don't have as much control, like in, in terms of how we can define the radiation there. It's in general, since skin is also very sensitive, those tissues are much more sensitive. Right. One of the reasons for developing the uh, high voltage, mega voltage beams was that in the olden days, uh, very old days, they used to do them with X-ray machines and they could only do as much as the skin tolerated. So they couldn't treat deep suited tumors because the skin would burn up first. So, right. but reimbursement wise, yeah, reimbursement wise, my only thought, like my personal thoughts are that like, I wish as a policy, like we could say like, if any treatment, it doesn't matter what treatment it is. If it creates like a certain effect, like if it cures you or like gives you control for 10 years, regardless of what you do to get there, like they should all be paid the same. That would be ideal. So it doesn't matter if it's a drug or if it's protons or it's photons or anything else one can think of because the end result is really what should be driving the reimbursement. Unfortunately, it's not. No, I, I agree. And interestingly, you know, I'm suspicious and I believe my my current oncologist is also suspicious that my initial treatment with radiation for the testicular actually caused the pancreatic to develop 20 years later. Right. So so um you know I'm I'm very sensitive to you know the, the more targeted we can get the better. Um and if it can avoid you know, sort of these downstream issues. I mean, at the time, proton beam didn't exist, so it wasn't really an option back in 1990. Um, but um, by the same token now, I would hope that if proton was offered a better solution and longer term, more stability, um, that reimbursement sort of wouldn't be the hurdle to stand in the way. So... Just just mention one thing. We had a session with Carl Rossi of California Proton, and I'll I'm mentioning that now so we can put it in the notes and we'll have a reference to it so people can see a full session we devoted to the proton therapy. I'd, I'd also like I, I, Jeff Blair. I don't I hope you don't mind if I call on you, but uh, as I recall, you did research on different uh, radiation centers, and even though you're based in the Boston area, you ended up choosing a, a Proton Center in the Philadelphia area. If if you are on and available, maybe you could tell us about that. Okay, I guess he isn't. Um, I, he he was on before. I guess he dropped off anyway. But then he he had a story like that where he was very uh, complimentary of the uh, proton. Uh, center that he found in the Philadelphia area. Uh, Chandler, would you happen to know what, what that might be? That would be UPenn, yeah. yeah. The UPenn. It was UPenn, I think that's right. I mean, uh, even, even the proton technology was developing so fast that not all proton centers have the same technology. There's some that are uh, older technology, which is where it doesn't uh, define the proton dose as nicely as the newer facilities might be able to do. And I, I wanted to just mention that uh, I mentioned like an MR LINAC, like uh, with MR guidance, which is really interesting because you can see what you treat. Uh, people thought that that machine could not be built, but physicists uh, persevered and they were able to do it. They figured out like the technological hurdles and overcame them. And I was reading more recently in the new in the literature, the trade literature that people have started to figure out how to combine MR and protons. So if you're able to see what you're treating with protons, that would be great. Like, except the cost would be quite high and we need to figure out this reimbursement piece in the whole grand scheme of things. Yeah. Alan, do you have your hand up? Hi, Dr. Koda. Um, I'm going to start by... A, uh, you are a medical physicist, right? Correct. You are not a radiation oncologist, right? Correct. I suspect you know a lot more medical physics than a radiation oncologist. Would you agree to that? Yes. Okay. 
So I, I just want to point out to everybody how disparate the fields are in uh, medicine. I think that's lost on almost everybody. Um, you work intimately with radiation oncologists. Your knowledge transfer working intimately with, with them must be as uh, close as any other two fields in uh, medicine. Yet you have admitted, and I know it to be the truth, you know medical physics astronomically more than a radiation oncologist. Now I want to ask you, now, now that I said a global statement, I want to ask a minutiae statement. I want to ask you a medical physics question. Mm -hmm. um, I've never understood it. I'm sure this is basic medical physics, but um, you pointed out on your plannings that, for example, the, the historic uh, conformal radiation therapy treatments had four beams. You mm -hmm. also pointed out that the newer IMRTs, it looked like, because I don't understand it, it mm -hmm. looked like there may be as many as six beams in some sort of circular mm -hmm. uh, thing. Then you also showed, as if implying that it's more advanced, the volumetric where it spins around the whole body. I don't know anything about this stuff, but my brain tells me intuitively, and it might be wrong, that the volumetric where you're maybe doing as much as infinite, and I'm sure you don't do infinite mm -hmm. cuts, that you're going to be reducing. I mean, the main difference in all of these, for everybody else that doesn't know, the main difference is not the radiobiology. It's, it's the off-target toxicity. So by doing this volumetric with all these different beams, you're attempting to reduce the off-target Dose is that correct? Well, let me uh, explain it a little differently. Okay. So when we went from three dimensional to conformal, like like I mentioned, there was a piece of technology called a multi leaf collimator. I unfortunately my video didn't play and I couldn't show it. So what it is is when a radiation is uh, imagine a radiation like a flashlight, right? Like you're pointing it at the tumor. So this multi leaf collimator is like little slivers of metal that. Uh, move in and out uh, of that uh, flashlight beam, trying to create different shapes for the tumor. So the earlier versions of multi-leaf collimators that we had, they could only work while the, gant the gantry is like what we call the machine. It was fixed at different positions around the patient. So that was that's why we first called it IMRT. It was slow because it had to go to a position at the patient and then the leaves had to move and you had to give the radiation. Then you go to the next position and the leaves had to move again and you give radiation. So it was better than 3D CRT, conformal therapy, no doubt. But it's not as good as a volumetric because now the gantry is moving continuously. So every one degree or so as we go around the patient, the shape of the leaves changes and it conforms to the target more precisely. And uh, in some directions, let's say there's a rectum in the path, it blocks the rectum more. So we are also not able, we are also able to shape around the organs that we want to spare very nicely. It's fast. It's much faster than the older technology. So the patient may lay there just for like five minutes instead of 20 minutes that they had to earlier. And that helps a lot because I've seen patients like prostate patients and we tell them to fill their bladder and it's, it's very difficult and it's just stressful, like it's unnecessarily. So the faster we do these treatments, there's less movement of the patient once we set them up and image them, and we can give better treatments. Okay, what you just did is you introduced two other variables. You introduced a collimator that makes it more pre precise and reduces the off-target, and you introduced the speed of the machine. So yeah. I, of course, those two things make the math more complicated, and that's why your field is a field, because it's complicated. It requires, I imagine, higher math and all sorts of stuff to do the treatment planning that is beyond a radiation oncologist. But nonetheless, even if you had a perfect collimator and you had a perfect speed in the machine or you optimize that, certainly optimizing the number of cuts in beams would also help in off-target uh, reducing toxicity. No? Am I not getting something? When you mean number of beams, it's... Uh... Yeah, in other words, like, for example, I was surprised that in, in the proton treatment, all they do is two beams. Yes. And instantly, even if you accept that there is no exit bath by virtue of the Bragg effect, there's still an entrance bath. That's so right. if you just have two beams, 
wouldn't you want to have four beams to reduce the entrance bath from the lateral side, reduce it to to uh, to uh, mitigating it a little bit with the anterior and posterior side, for example? Yes. So operationally, like that's an issue with throughput, right? If you only do it three, two beams, you'll be treating more quickly. If those machines also got much faster, if they're able to deliver those proton beams at a higher rate, and then you can optimize the timing it takes to treat a whole patient, like you could do more. Like, like you said, there's no downside to doing with more beams. It just takes longer. And uh, maybe those facilities feel that it's not clinically important to reduce it anymore. So, so in other words, with your fancy math and whatever, you in combination with insurance and payments and time discomfort and who knows how many other factors, you guys have optimized it such that, for example, with the proton people, the metaphys medical physicists that are involved in proton therapy have already vetted it and have figured out that two beams, two entrant beams is good enough. Is that, is that, is that fair? That's correct, yes. No. Yeah. Okay, you've cleared things up for me. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah. Uh, Richard Anders has a question. Um, well, a, a couple of questions. First, Alan's very interesting um, point it just made me wonder, what's the theoretical minimum if you had an infinite number of beams? What's the theoretical minimum for an average? I mean, that probably depends on the shape, but for an average non-zero um organ sort of is there like a theoretical minimum of what radiation you can deliver off target and still give an arbitrarily high radiation to the target uh, with photons there isn't right like i said photons uh, they go they go they, they go everywhere so with protons uh, we could if it's with a very protons you actually target. can deposit it right a proton you can deposit exquisitely sensitively you can just you right. in theory you only need one beam to get it exactly where you want it right you're just reading a pinpoint in the patient's body, like you just need one beam. Yeah, Brad Peak is very, very sharp. So you'd be able to do it for a very small target. But something so where- it out is as the target gets bigger, you need to be able to cover the whole target. And then like the Brad Peak uh, effect goes away, like it's kind of gets uh, smeared out. Does the Bragg effect scatter in all dimensions or does it just keep going in a straight line? Uh, sideways, you collimate it, like it's a collimation. In the, in the so if you could like, the Bragg peak is mainly to do with depth. It's the distance by, by which the proton would travel. I see. So if you could assume that a beam travels in a straight line and scatters really more or less in a straight line, and you had arbitrarily large number of beams, it, it can you deliver? Sideways too, like so. Uh, so when we usually treat like the the prostate as a cross section, right? Maybe like four or five centimeters. So the beam would be four or five centimeters across that's directed at the prostate. Uh, and you can deliver arbitrarily high, in theory, arbitrarily high doses to the prostate and arbitrarily low doses out of the prostate if you had enough beams in enough time? Um, I mean, there would be a minimum, like you said, like it's a... It would if, if if none of the entrance beams were overlapping with each other, right? Like they were all completely separated from each other, then the minimum would be like what's the entrance dose relative to the Bragg peak dose? That would be the minimum. Got it. But usually because of the size of the target, like the, the beams end up overlapping. So that yes, and, and you don't have arbitrarily many beams. I'm, I'm sorry, one other quick question. Do you know anything about, and do you think that this is fertile ground radio radiation sensitizers? I've seen a number of ideas for a drug here or a drug there that will, in theory, uh, home in somewhere and then make it very sensitive to radiation. Do you think there's merit in that, and is that coming of age? There it is. It's been. It's like kind of the holy grail, right? <laughs> you want to find something that sensitizes to radiation so you can treat better. Uh, a very really long time ago, like I did my dissertation on something called boron neutron capture therapy. Um, and seeing a little bit of activity there. So the idea was that like um, thermal neutrons, um, the boron has a very high concentration uh, cross section for thermal neutrons. And if you're able to tag something that goes to the tumor with boron and then it just sits there, 
and then you just bathe the patient with thermal neutrons, like the differential is like thousand four wow. body to tumors. So it's a, it's it's enormous. The problem is you just can't get the boron to go where you need it to go and nowhere else. <laughs> so, but there is one startup company out in California, I think called TAE Life Sciences, which is kind of doing something more on this. Uh, there is some activity there now. It's kind of, I think they're trying to write the coattails of the radio pharmaceuticals uh, activity going on. Like it's, it's kind of related, but not quite the same. So there's nothing there that you think is ready for prime time. Radio sensitizers, was there are a few that we use in the clinic, but there's nothing that's substantial, like nothing that re creates a therapeutic ratio, like like a factor of two or something. No. I see. Thank you. We had uh, some discussions of alternative therapies, and one of the things they were talking about was hyperbaric oxygen, and that was sensitizing people or potentiating the radiation more. Have you Have you heard of that, perhaps? That's uh, one of the reasons we fractionate radiation was that like uh, conventional wisdom uh, was that we would kill off the tumor cells that were well oxygenated and the ones that were not, that were hypoxic would then get reoxygenated. So the fraction, giving them in daily fractions helped in that regard. But when we went to giving very high doses per fraction in few fractions, like the so-called SPRT or stereotactic radio surgery, there's not much repair going on even with the uh, uh, hypoxic cells. It pretty much kills everything. And, and a lot of uh, biological mechanisms are still not very well understood. Like we keep talking about radiation killing cells, but those cells that die, like they release all kinds of uh, chemicals into their uh, microenvironment that kills other cells, right? It's a, it's, it's a very complicated phenomenon. So we're not quite sure, but on a practical daily basis, we do not do hyperbaric treatments before treatments. It's, it's not practical. Um, I'm gonna go to Alan for the last question, but um, just one other one. Um, can you just describe, this This is probably obvious, and we probably should already know this, but what is the role of the medical physicist in the evolution? So let's just say we've been talking a lot about prostate cancer. Maybe you get a prostatectomy, and then they're going to radiate the bed to make sure they got all of it. Um, mm -hmm. What would your role be then in working with the radiation oncologist to define the plan? Right, right. So um, in terms of... Um expertise and education level, like we are on par or next to the radiation oncologists. So we directly perform or work with the radiation oncologists in the most complex procedures. And for the less complex and the more common ones, we oversee those procedures. So for example, uh, tomorrow I'll be in clinic doing the three seed implants with my doctor. Um, so that's fairly complex and it needs a lot of physics inputs. So I'll be there with the patients and uh, treating them. There's uh, also a machine called CyberKnife, like you might have heard about it, which delivers very precise uh, high dose radiation. Uh, in that, like the physicists are involved in doing the planning and uh, in the treatment as well. But if you were to get like a conventional uh, prostate treatment, like 30 fractions, 30 treatments or so, uh, we would not be at the machine uh, doing it, or we would not be doing the plan uh, directly ourselves. We would have the dosimetrist do the plans and the therapist deliver the treatments, but we are overseeing the whole quality aspect of everything to make sure like nothing's missed and everything's correct. Okay, thank you. Alan, last question and then we'll wrap. Um, I'm following with doc what Dr. Coda said. So I just want to, People that don't live in the world that Dr. Coda and I live in don't know how comp complex and what a beehive it is. Dr. Coda, you asked, well, what's the different what's the different roles for radiation oncologists versus medical physicists? And Dr. Coda brought up, guess what? There's all these other people like radiation therapists and dosimeters and this, this and that. It's the same thing in laboratory medicine. We have a whole cadre of people that are involved, like most of the tests, I'm not directly involved at, at all. I'm just doing oversight. There's laboratory technicians. They have all sorts of names that go all the way up to clinical laboratory scientists, including people that have PhDs, you know? So they are doctors themselves, but they're in a whole other specialized field. 
And I guess what I'm doing is something that people that are familiar with me is I'm on my uh, uh, bandstand concerning the Tower of Babel. I keep pounding. That's my phrase for a Tower of Babel. We all, all these specialized fields speak different languages, and it's very hard for the two to communicate. Now I'm going on to whatever, what was, oh, geez, of course, now I forgot what I was going to ask or, or say. Oh, yeah, we, uh, Dr. Cota was asked about radio sensitizers, and he says, geez, that's the holy grail, and we don't know, and there's all this preclinical and animal mass models or whoever knows. There's all these studies with all these promising agents but everybody's forgetting the elephant in the room. And the elephant in the room is, hit, is, is Huggins, uh, ADT. There are innumerable phase three studies that proof in the pudding that ADT combined with radiation therapy is synergistic. It, you know, obviously there's all sorts of nuances, in particular with very high risk patients, in particular people that have uh, advanced, localized advanced disease. But it's, there, there's innumerable studies, and it's built into the NCCN guidelines about giving, you know, the debate now is whether you give 18 months or two years or three years or six months, and they're still doing studies about that. What's the best, what, what's the best on it? But they're honing it. They're maturing it. The word is maturing. They're maturing something that's already established. This is established. This is not holy grail. ADT is there and should be used unless, of course, a patient decides they don't want ADT no matter what, just like Jehovah Witnesses say, I don't want a blood transfusion no matter what, you know? And we have to deal with that in blood banking where we have to do all sorts of pretzel contortions to comply with the religious wishes of Jehovah Witnesses. Sorry for the, I guess that sounds political, Dan. I'm sorry for that. Okay. So, uh, Chandra, why don't you, uh, any final thoughts for us, any messages and, and thank you very much for your time today. Brad, one quick question. There was a, a chat by uh, Robert about flash proton technology. I don't know if anyone saw it or there's time to do a 30 seconds on it, but Robert I W. Did, asked, I, it, asked yeah, about flash proton technology. Yeah, I didn't see the chat, but yeah, it's definitely like in preclinical, they've seen that it does something very different than what we are used to in terms of what radiation does. So it goes back to the fact that it seems to do different things at different dose levels and different dose rates, and we're still trying to understand what it does. Early Hopefully, days, I guess. We'll be able to translate it into a clinical clinical uh, pathway. Yeah, so. Thank you. Any other, any final thoughts? I would uh, just say like, as a field, like we could use more patient advocates, like those who have had good experiences <laughs> speak up on our behalf. So like uh, maybe with their friends and family, so people are not scared of radiation and they realize like it, it, it has a role to play and a good role to play too. Okay.